I was so pumped the day I finally got the notification from the university. After shopping loads of schools, I had been accepted to my first choice. I won't name it here for reasons you'll discover later, but I will say it's a fairly prestigious school out west. I can't really say any more. Before I knew it, my first semester was here. My folks helped me move my stuff into the dorms and classes began within days. This was going to be my new home for the next year at least, so I went out of my way to make friends as soon as I could. That first night I ran into this pair of nerdy types who had known each other since first grade. I'll call them Greg and Bradley for the sake of the story. Both were well over six feet, easily towering over my 5'6 frame and wore almost the exact same glasses. As the days went on, they and I got to know each other really well. My first time in their room, I happened to notice a copy of the Satanic Bible on a table. My curiosity was piqued, and I asked if one or both of them were Satanists. They looked at each other and then looked back at me and laughed. My face must have shown my confusion. Bradley, the more outgoing of the two, laughed again and said they treated it more as a meme than anything. In the past, they used it to shock their friends back home. It sounded just as good a reason as any, so I let it go and went on to the next subject. School carried on as it does. As the end of the first semester came to an end, I ran back into the pair after not seeing them for the past week. Everyone had been occupied with studies and I was looking forward to catching up. Things had changed quite a bit since the last time I'd visited their room. An altar had taken pride of place in the corner. If it hadn't been for the pentagram poster on the wall above it and the statue of the devil, it wouldn't have drawn my attention. I pointed to it and made some half-hearted joke. The laughter I expected didn't occur. Rather, Bradley gave me this long monologue about how they had been wrong about the religion, how the Church of Satan were a bunch of cosplayers and how it actually had a lot to offer. I'll admit I didn't hide my skepticism, but I didn't push the matter. For all I knew, he was right. It was just another religion like any other. A bit unorthodox, perhaps, but I felt I had no right to criticize them. I've been raised to be open-minded towards others' beliefs. Besides, I had no reason to be concerned, so once again I changed the subject and steered the conversation on to another subject. So the semester ended and we all returned home for the break. I had a great time seeing my parents and catching up with my friends. Before I knew it, the vacation was over and it was time to go back to school. It was two days after the start of classes when Bradley and Greg came to visit my room. Something was different about them. They had a very somber air about them. Both guys were dressed in all black. The biggest change was their glasses. Neither one was wearing any. I brought it up and they said that they had gotten contacts over the holiday. Sounded like a good idea, but for some reason Bradley made a point of saying they wanted to be taken more seriously, which struck me as a weird thing to say. We talked about our holiday and then Bradley suggested we play a game of magic with a group of other guys from the dorm. Later that day, we all got together and played late into the night. More than once, Bradley would go off on a tangent about power and the accumulation of it. I wrote this off as a side effect of the game. I played with the guys who enjoyed getting into their characters in the past, and this seemed like a thing he and Greg would do. He wrapped up at around 2am, and I hit the sack soon after. After that night, I'd see Bradley and Greg less and less. I could see no reason for them to be angry, so I figured something was keeping them busy. Out of the blue, I ran into them on the last week of the semester. They had become almost unrecognizable. Both guys had lost a bunch of weight and looked as if though they hadn't slept in weeks. Initially, they hadn't noticed me, but I gasped in surprise at their appearances and it got their attention. They began walking toward me. A feeling of unease crept up from my stomach. I wasn't sure why until Bradley began speaking in an erratic, clipped manner. I thought he may have been on drugs. Greg, who usually let Bradley do the talking, chimed in. His manner was less manic, but the glee in which he spoke creeped me out even more. He was eager to tell me how he and Bradley had discovered a way to make the other students respect them. They were on their way to get their sacrifice when we met. For a brief second, I thought it was an act. 
I look closer at both of them for reassurance, but only madness looked back at me, is all I can really describe it as. And a shiver ran through me, and I could feel the goosebumps spring up on my arms. I was terrified just being near them, so I did the only thing I think I could and played along. All I wanted in that second was to get away and find help. Some evil force had consumed my old friends, and I was afraid it was making them do something terrible, even if it was just in their mind. Thinking quickly, I played a cool and wished them luck, and they didn't appear alarmed as I walked calmly toward my room. When I was out of sight, I fumbled with my phone as I called campus security. I feared they wouldn't take the threat seriously, and... I was right, so I hung up and dialed 911. I explained my concerns to the operator in as dramatic a manner as possible, and she must have believed me. Less than 30 minutes later, I watched from a window as Bradley and Greg were actually taken into custody mere moments before they would have driven away. My initial misgivings that I may have been a tad overzealous were discounted when news reached me about what the cops had found in the car. Apparently, not only did they have in-depth notes on the habits and photos of a certain female student, a large ceremonial Indian-style knife was discovered in a small bag belonging to Bradley. I awaited with bated breath some news about the arrest of my old friends, but none ever materialized. Other than a small blurb in the local newspaper which greatly downplayed the story, no other coverage occurred, and I have no clue what truly happened although I have a few suspicions. Among them, and my favorite theory, was that the school hushed it up. Rather than have their incompetence in the matter become public, they may have cut a deal with the cops to keep it quiet. I do know Bradley and Greg took a plea. They never returned to school, and may have done some prison time, but that's never been ascertained. I'm not even sure if the poor girl who had been the target of their ghoulish plan was even notified and I somehow doubt she stayed ignorant for long. Although, the incident may not have reached the wider world among the denizens of the school, it was far from secret. I can't say Andre was a particularly weird dude. I didn't know him well, but every time we did speak, he came across as completely normal. He was a pretty quiet guy, not very talkative, but then again, I've never been either. His personal interactions with others, at least the ones I witnessed, appeared totally above board. And as far as I'm aware, he did okay in classes and never had any more trouble with his teachers than anyone else. What I'm saying is, nobody I hung out with had any concerns about his sanity. The events of the coming years would show how horrible and terrible a judge of character I had been. Maybe those closer to him knew the true face behind the mask. As for me, when the facts of his case came out, I was shocked. Then it only got worse from there. As often happens, life moved on after high school, as did I, and Andre became a small part of my childhood. Then one morning as I flipped through my newspaper, a face from my past was staring back at me, and what I read in the article adjoining it made my blood run cold. Since I'm not a professional writer, I thought I used the account the Texas Tribune's managing editor, Brandy Grissom, used in a feature she wrote for Texas Monthly. She states, By 2004, Andre was 21 years old, deeply mentally ill and receiving no treatment. On the bright clear morning of March 27th, he charged up the stairs to the third floor apartment where Laura, his estranged wife, lived and kicked in the door. Her boyfriend had already left for work. Andre was holding three knives, one for each of his intended victims. He first encountered Laura, who ran toward him screaming no. Andre plunged a knife into her chest. He then reached in and pulled out what he believed was her heart. He had, in fact, extracted part of her lung. Next, he headed for the children's room, where Andre Jr. and one-year-old Leia were sleeping. Andre held down his four-year-old son and stabbed him before moving on to Leia. He carved out each of the children's hearts. Finally, Andre jammed a knife into his own chest three times and laid down beside Laura on the living room floor, expecting to die. Confounded when he didn't, 
He slipped the organs he had removed into his pocket and walked more than five miles home. A few hours later, he went to the Sherman Police Department where he confessed to the murders and asked if he would be forgiven. I thought it was what God wanted me to do, he later told investigators. After undergoing emergency surgery to repair his life-threatening stab wounds, Andre was moved to the Grayson County Jail, where his behavior became more and more psychotic. He gestured wildly and announced that he was going to save the world. He claimed to be the 13th warrior of the dollar bill, and said that Laura and the children weren't dead, but that their hearts had been freed from evil. Horrified doesn't begin to describe my feelings upon reading this. Had he always been hiding the monster inside him, or as often happens, had the specter of schizophrenia gradually taken hold of him as he entered into his early 20s? It's an answer I doubt I'll ever really get. Almost everything written on the case focuses on the monstrosity of the crime rather than its causes. As shocking as this all was, the case was destined to only become more bizarre. I figured once the trial eventually came around, Andre would eventually be found guilty and given multiple life sentences or the death penalty. No matter the result, he would do just as he had before and slip to the back of my mind, perhaps only being thought of on very rare occasions. It appeared, however, he wasn't quite ready to be forgotten. Just six days after taking the lives of his family, my old school acquaintance gouged out his right eye. It was claimed he did so because of a Bible passage he'd read. Even after all this odd behavior, he was deemed fit to stand trial for capital murder. Just as I'd imagined when the time came, he was found guilty for all three murders and sentenced to death. The people for Texas had spoken, and the time had come for Andre to move off to his new home on death row. As before, I foolishly believed his and my stories had diverged for the last time and nothing more could happen. Andre had one more card up his sleeve to play, however, and one more eye left to pluck out. Once again, the story said he'd blinded himself because of the very same Bible verse. However, this time he upped the ante on two counts. Rather than stabbing out the offending eye, he yanked it from the socket. The second part was far more gruesome. When the guard who discovered him in his cell, covered in blood, asked the location of said eye, the answer was simple. He'd eaten it. Despite what's been printed in all of the sensationalist newspaper articles, the true reason for blinding himself seems to be an attempt to force the state of Texas to give him the psychiatric care he'd been asking for since his arrest. It appears he'd gotten his wish, but as it stands now, his death sentence remains standing. The way things are currently, Andre is being held in a state psychiatric facility awaiting his day with the executioner, and that's the extent of any information I've been able to come across. As recently as 2013, a Texas Court of Criminal Appeals judge found the defendant clearly crazy, but also sane under Texas law. While I'm not here to discuss the finer points of whether the death penalty is a good or bad thing, that's a far deeper lake than I'm prepared to wade into. I think we could all agree the man has some problems. I've included only the most important facts in my retelling, but you'll have no problem finding more through a simple internet search if you're so inclined. However, I do warn you, the remaining details are not for the faint of heart. For some readers, the outright gruesome nature may prove to be too much. You've been warned. Everybody in school knew Natasha was different. I suppose different as being kind. When you live in a town where everyone around you acts and looks very much the same, a girl like her would of course stand out. I'd have to describe her as a goth girl, if that term is even still used. Her skin had a naturally pale tone, but she did all she could to make sure it never got any darker. The Victorian parasol she carried everywhere with her blocked out any possible ray of sun from touching her porcelain-like skin. As if her skin and hundred-year-old umbrella didn't make her stand out, her choice of clothing just made her appear stranger to most. I don't think Naughty, as we called her, owned any color but black. 
from her coal black hair all the way down to the tips of her patent leather boots, only the chalkiness of her skin offered any contrast. If you were to guess that she was quiet and reserved, you wouldn't be far off. When she did speak, it was only in reaction to another's rude remarks. Even then, she was a girl of few words. She had a cutting type of wit. It didn't take her long to put folks in their place. Most people never got to see her other side. This version of Naughty was terrifying and most likely the cause of her future ghoulish behavior. Before I get to the meat and potatoes of my story, I want to warn my readers. If you are triggered or get excessively upset about the subject of animals getting hurt, stop here. Although I will try to be as family friendly in my descriptions as possible, some things just have to be said. You've been warned. With that out of the way, I'll finally get to the heart of the matter. Despite knowing not everyone who looks and dresses like Naughty are capable of doing the things she did, I think that look was a reflection of how she felt inside. I could never excuse her behavior, but coming from someone who knew her rather intimately, she had to have struggled with that evil inside of her. The Naughty I knew was an intelligent and sensitive person. Nonetheless, she harbored a deep-seated anger that drove her to commit a string of unforgivable acts. I never learned exactly what caused it, but I suspect it stemmed from some form of abuse she suffered. I foolishly asked about her grandfather on one occasion. This regular everyday question caused a 30-minute tirade. Safe to say, he wasn't a good person. This is likely what led to her compulsion to have power over another living thing. I was already off at school for my first year of college. Naughty, who was a year younger than me, was a senior. We were still on speaking terms after our separation, but I would not heard from her for a few months. When I had a spare moment, I called to catch up. Her mother answered her phone and said, This naturally surprised me. My surprise soon turned to concern when I was told that Naughty wasn't around anymore. I was shocked and asked what had happened expecting her to say that she passed. Mrs. Ellis coldly stated that Naughty had not died, but she wouldn't be free to speak to me ever again. Then she quickly said goodbye and hung up. I was confused and hungry for answers, so I called a friend who had stayed behind to work. The story I heard still chills me to this day. My friend's dad was a retired cop and still had a lot of contacts inside the department, I knew he'd probably know what happened. A lot of the details concerning her punishment were hazy, but the gruesomeness of her crimes were not. The story goes something like this. Not long after her and I separated, people's cats began to disappear. The ones that were eventually found, the bodies had been drained of their blood and ripped to pieces. Initially, the deaths were attributed to a coyote or dog attacks. With no blood found at the scene, this theory didn't hold up. A few of the wackier folks around town even claimed the deaths were the work of the chupacabra. A total of 22 pets would be lost to the cat slasher in all. Owners who had once let their cats out began keeping their pets in, and neighbors watched their fellow citizens with distaste and distrust. Then, late one evening, the true culprit was caught in the act. A man was out walking his dog when he took notice of a car driving slowly up and down the street. It had passed him several times, but he assumed the driver was searching for a particular address. This changed when he turned onto a new street and witnessed the driver get out and attempt to catch a cat. When the driver realized they'd been seen, they returned to the car and sped away. It was too late, though. The man copied down the license plate number and turned it into the police. The crime that hadn't had much attention from the police until then drew much more of their interest when the car's owner was discovered. Natasha was no stranger to the police. She'd had multiple complaints filed against her in the past. Most were actually just baseless accusations from older people who distrusted her simply because she looked different. She's a devil worshipper and other equally stupid fantasies. However, she'd also been caught shoplifting once or twice. Fortunately for her, she had some mysterious family connection that made everything go away. Things wouldn't be any different this time. Despite admitting everything to the cops that interviewed her, often in gory detail, she would be let off with no repercussions. In fact, the press didn't even mention a suspect had been arrested. 
Despite knowing her name and all that was said, it was almost as if none of it had even happened. The disappearances just stopped, and almost nobody even knew why. At first, I was in complete shock, but as time passed, it began to make sense. Nadi had always hated cats. I never discovered why, but something major had to have occurred to cause her behavior. And before anyone asks if she took this dark turn because of our breakup, just forget it. She was more than happy to be free again. In fact, I may have been the only thing keeping her from going down that path sooner. For all I know, it had already started prior to our separation and nobody had noticed. I'm guilt-free, my friend. During my visits back home, the subject was brought up a few times. One guy even said he had heard she had been drinking the blood of the cats. She wasn't beyond doing something so crazy, but the girl I knew would have thought something so ceremonial was stupid. Through the grapevine, I did eventually discover where she had gone. Mere days after her release, she was shipped off to a mental health facility out west. What happened to her after that, I have no clue. Despite the terrible and cruel things she did, I still catch myself hoping she'll call from time to time. Mostly, I just want to hear her explanation. Whether I do or not, I hope she gets the help she needs. I'd hate to know more people's pets could be in danger because she couldn't resolve the problems from her past. If she does contact me, I'll post an update. Watch this line and stay tuned. I'm just as morbidly curious as you. I attended most of my schooling in a small town in southern Oklahoma. In a place with such a small population, you get to know everybody pretty fast. When you're a kid, this can be a big headache. You can't make a single mistake without everyone around knowing about it, including your folks. To this day, I can still tell you the name of the girl that ate paste in kindergarten and the boy who peed his pants in third grade. It's not a way I'd like my kids to grow up. Nonetheless, even in a place so small, there was one kid who managed to live a second, invisible life right under the noses of the nosiest of citizens. For the sake of the story, I'll call him Elliot. He was the last person you'd expect of having a secret life. His family had run the largest business in the county for a hundred years. If I recall correctly, he even had two uncles who had served in the state legislature. He had been raised to be a successful person and, on the surface, nothing about him gave you the impression that he was anything else. All the teachers loved him. His grades were always better than everyone else's and he never hesitated to make himself the center of attention. Even with every eye in the area on him, he had one habit no one had any clue about. Elliot liked to watch. This clean-cut, unassuming young man was a peeper. A peeping Tom. A voyeur, if you will. Of course, nobody knew this, or admitted to it at least. This would all change on the night of homecoming. Our classmates were all kitted up in their finest, each waiting their turn to get their pictures taken so they could head to their real destination a local hotel where loads of cheap booze awaited them. Normally, Elliot would be one of the few actually attending the dance with his girlfriend. Instead, while the rest of the town had their minds on the celebration, he was creeping through his quiet neighborhood in search of something to see. Just before 11, he came upon the open window of a 10-year-old girl. He later told the police that, on a prior expedition, he had noticed the girl's open curtains. Upon getting closer... He watched as she removed her clothes for bed, and despite knowing it was wrong, he realized for the first time that he was attracted to very young girls. He claimed he was disgusted by this and cut his nighttime journey short. As time passed, however, the urge to return overtook him. Because of all the people on the streets that night, he wasn't able to return early enough to relive the previous adventure in his mind. When he arrived and saw the open window, a little voice told him, to go inside. The house is dark. Everyone's already in bed, so no one would see you. Besides, you just want to watch her sleep, that's all. Unfortunately, Elliot listened to this voice. Entering as silently as possible, he walked across the room toward the corner. He was just inches away when he stepped on a squeaky dog toy, apparently. 
The high-pitched noise echoed through the room. He froze and prayed the girl wouldn't be awakened. God was not with him that night at all. She shot up in bed as if she had been awaiting such a moment, and things just got worse from there. She turned on her bedside light and Elliot was fully illuminated. The terrified girl began screaming, and Elliot knew he only had a few seconds to flee. He turned and ran for the window, and he was mere feet away from where a strong hand grabbed him by the collar and yanked him back in. He'd barely hit the floor before a hail of powerful kicks and punches rained down upon him. The most he could do was curl up and take the abuse. A moment later, the violence stopped and he peeked out from his arm, and looking down on him was who he'd assumed to be the girl's father. The man's face terrified him. He'd never seen such anger until then. The police arrived quickly and within minutes, they had Elliot in cuffs. It wasn't long before the whole town knew. Although he hadn't done more than trespass into a house at night, the district attorney tried to charge him with every crime possible. Even with all the money and influence of his family behind him, there was no way he was getting off scot-free. He had foolishly spoken to the cops. They had his words to use against him. His lawyer was able to get the DA to drop most of the charges in exchange for a plea. Ultimately, he served 13 months in jail with an additional five years probation tacked on. The length of the sentence meant nothing. His life in town was over. After he was released, he became a prisoner in his own home. He didn't dare leave. A day didn't go by without some death threat or other harassment on his phone. To the relief of everybody, the day his probation ended, he quietly slipped out of town in the middle of the night. Never to be seen again. Since my very youngest days, I was treated as a golden child. My mother heaped buttloads of affection onto me and bragged to her friends how great of a son I was. I fear my younger brother missed out because she had already spent all of the love she had on me, so to speak. I joke about this, but I am somewhat serious at the same time. His upbringing lacked much of the praise and attention I was given. When I began playing in organized sports, the rest of the world joined in. Soccer came first. It all came so naturally and before long I was the top scoring member of the team. Once I discovered football, everything else went by the wayside. Posters of Brady and Bledsoe covered my walls. My large strong hands allowed me to grip and throw the ball with the power and precision not many twice my age had. All three years of middle school I remained the starting quarterback. I did so well that by high school I was playing on par with most seniors. My prowess in sports of course made me very popular in school. One of my teachers called me the big man on campus. I was never lacking the attention and approval of the staff and most of my fellow students. I didn't get a free ride though. Without good grades I wasn't qualified to play. Luckily for me I had always been good at most subjects except for perhaps math in which I scored lower Bs. I had decided by my second year which college I would attend. I knew if I continued on my current path, I'd be quarterbacking for a professional team right out of college. To encompass all I had achieved, I quote a line I had once read that described a man as having the world in the palm of his hand. That's probably the best way I could describe the trajectory I had put upon myself. I was destined for success and nothing was going to get in my way. I tell you all this in order to show just how far I was soon to fall and exactly how much I was about to lose. I was a junior. I had already been named the starter on the varsity team. When not studying, I split my time between the weight room and practice. It was just before the third game of the season when Rosalind arrived. I had my mind off somewhere else when she entered our class. I still remember it like it was yesterday. A few of my classmates were grumbling about something and it caught my attention. I happened to look up just as she was passing near me, and her beauty was breathtaking. I can honestly say with confidence you've never seen her equal in Hollywood. The rich silkiness of her auburn hair, to the sensual fullness of her lips and her porcelain skin, on an inch of her image had a flaw. I gave her my heart in that moment and I knew nothing would equal her in my life. She took her seat at the back of the class. 
none of the shyness that usually existed in the newly arrived student showed in her actions. The room was hers completely now, and she knew it. My focus was on her for the remainder of the period. She had to have known. My gaze would have burned right through her had my eyes been lasers. This day marked the beginning of a long, downhill slide, and I would give anything to experience every second of that time again. Concentrating on anything else was impossible. Class after class, only Rosalind existed. Practice was much the same. I wasn't on a football field. I was still in that class, soaking in every inch, every curve of her body. From then on, my only thoughts were about her. I used my charm to get her address from an office worker. That Friday evening, as I led the team to another victory, my only desire was for the game to end. Afterwards, I sat outside her house dreaming about her and I, walking hand in hand through the halls as everyone watched jealously. I resolved in that moment that I would own her body and soul until the end of my life. My first action upon arriving at school that following Monday was to locate Rosalind and bear my heart to her. I did just that, but her reaction wasn't what I'd envisioned. I spoke from my heart. Every word was true, but rather than collapse into my arms as I'd seen on TV so many times, she replied with four short words. I don't think so. I will admit to being disappointed, but her response left me with a ray of hope. She hadn't been cruel or mocking after all. Perhaps she had been playing hard to get. I knew I had to pursue her as a hunter pursues his prey. Maybe I would even be required to make a large sacrifice to prove my love. After all, that's the way it works in the great Hollywood films and novels. She would realize she belonged with me. I just needed to help her realize that. I searched my soul, day and night, for a way to make this happen. Suddenly it hit from out of the blue. If I gave up football, she would have to see how dedicated I was to her. That day I informed the coach of my decision. It went about as well as you would think. He was angry and yelled for almost an hour, but at the end of our meeting, he wished me well. I was elated. I had to tell Rosalind that very second. She didn't answer my text right away, but when she did, her only answer was, Why? The queasiness churned up in my stomach. Even after all I'd done to let her know I loved her, putting it into words still made me very nervous. I did it for you, I said. My hands shook as they moved to push send. It was now or never. She would be left with no doubt to how I felt about her. After sending it, the time seemed to drag on forever. The hours passed with no word from her, and I couldn't take it any longer. I sped over to her house and waited outside her window. I watched as she changed for bed. Every curve, every line of her body remains with me to this day. I sent a new text to let her know that I was waiting. She appeared at her window within seconds. Seeing her in the nightgown made my heart race, and there was only one reason she would let me see her this way. My mouth was dry with anticipation. I broke into a sweat. I expected to be met with soft words, but instead she began yelling, almost screaming. Her words didn't make sense. I was confused by her behavior. It only got worse when her father came outside. I tried to explain my love for his beautiful daughter, but he was deaf to my words. Rosalind began to curse me from her window, terrible things I don't dare repeat here. I never dreamed this could have happened. With every word, her curses knocked me lower and lower. It was a pain I'd not wish on anyone. I was so distraught I didn't hear the word police until it was almost too late. I fled just as I noticed flashing lights up the street. I laid down in my car as they passed and sped away as they pulled up to Rosalind's house. My sobs grew and grew until I was consumed by my grief. I laid curled up upon my bed wailing uncontrollably. However, as my tears began to subside, another fire kindled inside. My anger roared by the second, until it consumed any sadness I once had. And by dawn, I had transformed into some sort of beast. A monster I never knew existed in me had taken control of my body. I began to rage. I thought, no one says those things to someone who loves them. They know the power they have over them. 
The idea of punishment fleeted in and out of my brain, briefly at first, then more and more until it set root and fostered a plan for retribution. I see now just how far I had gone. My love, if that's what you can call it, had transformed from obsession into hate. The quickness in which this occurred still terrifies me. In that day and in that time, I could only think of one thing. Revenge. She had to feel my pain. There was no other way she could learn what she had done. I entered the school that morning with a single, focused purpose. My anger had clouded my mind from considering the consequences of what I was about to do. I could see the terror in her eyes as I drew closer, and I can remember feeling satisfied by this. I said nothing. I just grabbed her by the throat, both hands gripping as tightly as possible, and I knew it wouldn't take long. My grip was strong and my hands were large. I was oblivious to the grabbing and pulling of others around me. Her face took on a dark red, then almost purple hue, and I knew it wouldn't be long now. I stared into her beautiful green eyes, eyes that I had dreamt of for countless hours and was awed by them even as they filled with the streaking of blood. My adoration angered me even more. The next thing I remember was lying on the school floor being held down. The din of their yells seemed muffled. I was miles away, lost in the confusing pattern of the ceiling tiles above me. I'm not sure how long it was before I was told Rosalind had survived. It appeared I had been stopped before I was able to achieve my goal. This news didn't anger me, nor was I relieved. I had become numb. It's taken me many months to reclaim the identity I once was. I was terrified to feel anything. I'd become nothing more than a frightened child. I've been fortunate enough to be sent to an institution that focuses on therapeutic rehabilitation. I'm by no means fully healed for the lack of a better word. There still are moments where I find myself giving over to my dark side. I don't necessarily blame the entertainment industry for the way they portray relationships or the pursuit of love in a wider context. I'm responsible for the way I handle the situation. Something inside of me is broken. However, in the same breath, I do question what impression they intend on presenting. A young, naive, and romantic man such as myself is inundated with talk of the so-called game and the premise of sacrificing for love, among other trite concepts. Without any real guidance from a more experienced adult or father figure, a young male often uses images from the popular entertainment around him. It is a discussion that should be had considering more boys are growing up without a positive male role model in their lives. Please pardon me for going off onto my own path. I still require a lot of work. The purpose of writing this was to recount the events that led me to my current position. My counselor and I agreed that it would be a good idea to put my story and my feelings at the time on paper. It could serve as a motivating factor for myself and others to see how far I've come in my therapy. Now that I have, it is certainly encouraging to see the progress I've made. At the same time, it's shed light upon the darker side of my personality and that has been a horrifying vision. Despite this, I'm confident I'm on the path to regaining my true self and perhaps one day you'll recognize the brother you grew up with. I've just about written down everything I can recall from that time and Lights Out is quickly approaching. I'll make a copy of this for my counselor minus a little epilogue to you. Of course, I'll be sending you this version for yourself. Feel free to share it with your mom or anybody else in the family that may be curious. I've written mom a short note just about regular stuff and sent it last week so she should receive that soon. If you have the time, I'd like you to do something like we discussed and seek out the proper place on the internet to share this. All I ask is that you leave out my name, but I probably don't have to tell you that. I'm sure you don't normally tell people your older brother is... psycho. I'd like young people to be able to read an authentic account of what goes on in the mind of someone like me without all the sensationalistic fluff. I don't seek notoriety or frame for what I've done. It is an inexcusable act against one I profess to love. My hope is that it can serve as a template for the young, a diagnostic instrument to help them recognize the same patterns in their friends or themselves 
and stop them before they get out of control. I'd like to think if more people had access to this type of information, things like stalking and the crimes that go with it may be able to be stopped completely, or at the least greatly reduced. I'll continue to do all I can to stem the tide from here. Perhaps, if enough on the outside can see this, we can create a better world for everyone. From my experience, most everybody had that creepy dude they knew from school or hung out with. In my school, we all called him Jay, and he was perhaps the creepiest of the creepy. I had the unenviable honor of being there on his first day. It was kindergarten and a lot of the kids threw a fit when they were separated from their parents. I don't hold that against them. We were only five after all. Rather than accepting the separation and joining the others in class, he made things even worse. His mom hadn't been gone ten minutes and he soiled himself. This wasn't a reaction to stress, like you may expect. It turned to be out of pure spite. He must have used this before to control people. When the teacher called his mother, she returned in a matter of minutes and took him home. He had such a smug look on his face as he left, and I knew even then as a little kid that things weren't getting better. The following day, his mother dropped him off in class and he repeated the disgusting behavior and, of course, his mother was called again to pick him up. This vicious power play continued for a week. His mom would leave, he'd ball his head off for five minutes straight only to soil himself again. You probably get it by now. That Friday morning would be the last time I'd see Jay for almost ten years. We moved forward to the first day of sophomore year. We were all sitting in our chairs and the teacher calls out everyone's names. When she called out Jay's, I almost soiled myself. I looked around frantically until this short, overweight kid raised his hand. He was almost a carbon copy of the little kid I remembered. Except now, he looked even worse. His hair was long and greasy, his face covered by patches of hair, and he was wearing this old gray jacket with stains all over it. I think it may have been a members-only one. This was 2013. I was unable to grasp why he looked so bad. As far as I was aware, his family wasn't poor. In fact, I believe his dad was a dentist with his own practice. My amazement toward him would only grow. As class was let out and he passed by me, a cloud of stink almost knocked me down. Man, did he smell. Similar to wet garbage. I probably should have expected it considering his appearance, but this level of funk was all new to me. I did my best to keep my head down and slip out unnoticed. As far as I could tell, he didn't remember me. And boy was I relieved. Little did I know, his hygiene would become the least of his cons. A month passed and school was as lame as ever. Jay remained offensive to the nose and eyes. His gray jacket had become dirtier than his hair. I think he even had Dorito crumbs falling off of it one morning. Unfortunately, his behavior would be far nastier. I caught wind of a story going around that some kid was showing other male students lewd photos of his sister. When I discovered it was Jay, I can't say I was shocked. Disgusted, but not shocked. Eventually, my time came. He approached me in my locker and shoved his phone in my face. Once I was able to focus on the screen, I realized it was indeed a photo of a girl who looked disturbingly similar to himself. I can't say I recall the quality of the picture. His stench was just too distracting. Even though I was in a constant state of discomfort, I was taken aback at how proud he was of the picture. His smile stretched from ear to ear. It was like he was showing me a hot rod he'd built with his dad. And perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the encounter was when I learned that the girl was only 13. I couldn't imagine how strange his relationship with his sister must have been. No matter how gruesome things connected to this dude were, he always managed to outdo himself. I guess the shots were so popular he took things up a level and began selling the videos of her showering. Although I was lucky enough not to see those atrocities, I was told by folks who did that Rather than being some creep videos, the subject was well aware that she was being filmed. I can't say she was aware her brother was selling them, though. Of course, Jay's dirty little secret wouldn't stay that way for long. It wasn't more than a week after he launched his filmic endeavor before it was shut down. 
the principal, and others in power at the school got word of his actions, and he was brought in for questioning. Once they had a full grip on what had been going on right under their noses, law enforcement was informed, thankfully. The rest came to me by word of mouth, so take it with a pinch of salt. According to some people, things between Jay and his sister were even more shocking than we believed. She would admit that her and Jay had been involved in some form of physical relationship for the last three years. In addition to that, he wasn't just selling videos around school. He'd been peddling far more explicit clips on the dark web, believe it or not, at least what I was hearing. The rumor mill was churning in overdrive. Jay's sudden disappearance led to all kinds of theories and suppositions. What I do know is that he was gone almost as quickly as he had arrived, and not many missed him. The same source I had gotten my information from prior claimed he had done a few months in a juvenile facility and was released. Basically a slap on the wrist. However, at the time, there was still the question of how hard the feds were going to go after him. Unfortunately, life moved on and... I guess folks forgot about Jay, and I can't tell you his ultimate fate. Despite him being a disgusting mess of a person, I feel bad for the others who suffered because of him. The strain revolving around the situation caused his parents to divorce, but perhaps the person who suffered the most was his younger sister. Not only had her public life been ruined, she was forced to drop out of school soon after it all came out. The abuse she had suffered at the hands of Jay has to have done some major long-term damage. I pray she's been able to make something of her life. As for Jay, I could care less how he is. Creatures like him never change. They destroy lives of all those around them, and the world will be a much better place without him. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I'm still trapped in the basement.